Dalasi is a, a traditional and contrary musician in Solomon Islands who has been uh, performed uh, in, in, in country and all around the world uh, representing Solomon Islands in the, in the region and even in the world. Uh, before I introduce the, our speaker, I would like to extend the uh, a word of welcome to, to those around uh, the country and around the world who have joined us online um, uh, in this session. Thank you very much. Um, without further ado, let me um, uh, uh, go through the, the abstract of our, our presentation. Uh, this talk will explore some of the reasons why, in spite of its natural resource endowment, generally Solomon Islands resource owners still find themselves largely as spectators in so far as the benefit that flow from the extraction of their natural resources is concerned. In spite of the fact that most of the commercial logging occurs on customary land. There are very few, if any, resource owning groups that own any commercial building in Solomon Islands. Most, if not all, of the more recent real estate developments around East Honera are spawned by loggers who also, more often than not, are foreigners. The talk will explore some of the challenges in the political economy surrounding the extraction, extractive industry, and look at the institu institutional governance arrangements that, that impedes the extraction, extractive industry. The talk will examine the political establishment it will explore the role that both elected and unelected officials have and how these complex webs of relationship has undermined effective natural resource management. The talk will suggest recommending reforms towards returning to a merit-based system public service institution and move away from the politics of clientelism and political patronage, which is harming good natural resource management to the detriment of resource owners. Uh, Dr. Transform Agorao is an international fisheries law and development expert by qualification. He has worked with the Solomon Islands government and several regional organizations, including the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat and the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency, and was instrumental in the establishment of the PNA office in the Marshall Islands as the pioneer CEO. He was 
it was in that role, in his capacity as administrator of the Vessel Day Scheme, VDS, that he oversaw the transform transformation of the world's largest tuna fisheries in the world and ensure that parties increase the share of the economic returns from the tuna resources from US dollars 60 million to US 470 to 500 million when he left the position. On leaving the PNA, he established ITUNA Intel, a locally based research consultancy. ITUNA Intel partnered with Duke University in North Carolina, USA, University of Wollongong, USP and Environment Defense Fund, a US environment not-for-profit to set up Pacific Catalyst, a research consortium working to develop the next generation of Pacific Islands fisheries leaders. Dr. Agorao is director and founder of OSA International, a New Zealand-based not-for-profit working on social accountability issues in the fishing industry. And is on the board of director of the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation, a US-based not not for profit that includes the largest tuna fishing companies and processes in the world. He was influential in getting the development of getting the recent loans and integrated digital traceability and catch documentation system developed for NORO for the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources. Working with the Ministry SIG ICT services, Soltuna, NFD, Custom, and Health. They have established the very first wholly integrated digitized fishing port in the Pacific Islands, known as. Noro Ipot. Dr. Angorau is currently working as legal advisor to the Marshall Islands Marine Resource Authority. He is also visiting professor for the Ocean Studies at SINU and visiting fellow at the Australian National Centre for Oceans Resource Security at the University of Wollongong. He is a current member of the University of South Pacific um, Council. He was also visiting fellow at the School of Governance, Development, and International Affairs at USP. He has written extensively on fisheries, development, governance, and resource management in the Solomon Star. Dr. Agoro has published an internationally recognized peer-reviewed journal and has published two books, The Reflection of a Solomon Islander, Development and Governance Challenge of a Small Island State, published in 2012, and Fishing for Success, Lessons for the Pacific Regionalism, published by the Australian National University in 2020. Dr. Angoro holds a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Papua New Guinea, Masters of Law from the University of British Columbia in Canada, and doctorate in law from the University of Wollongong. He was recognized for his service to fisheries in Solomon Islands by the head of state, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, to be a member of the British Empire in her 2021 Queen's Birthday Awards and Honours. I am pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Agora. Thank you, Primo, for those kind words. Um, Mr. Speaker, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Director of USP. Um, one talks and colleagues listening out in the region. And more importantly, our young aspiring 
and the future of Solomon Islands. So, ladies and gentlemen, today I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. And thank you very much, Calvin, for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you on, on, an, on, a, on a subject matter that would be of interest to you. I hope that by the end of this talk, I'd be able to give you some kind of uh, inspiration that would make you angry and want to do something for this country. I am particularly pleased to be talking on this subject which I've called the suffering impo impo impoverished resource owners of, of Solomon Islands and why is the state failing us and failing her people. And I speak from personal, ex uh, actually I speak from personal experience having come from a, a land owning area in, in Solomon Islands that has been exploited over and over again. And so I know from personal experience that the hard questions of what is happening to our resources and why is it that after repeated logging, resource extraction, we still, only last week I was at home at Munda and we, we had to, we still actually drawing water from the well. So something is seriously missing and, and wrong. And so I've been wondering about that question. For a country like ours that is, can you move on to that? country like ours that is naturally resource endowed, we're blessed with a lot of land, we're blessed with the cleanest air in the world, we're blessed also with um, a huge youth population, we're blessed with a lot of trees, rich mineral resources, and yet, yet we find ourselves in a situation where the level of our human development index which is a measurement of how far we've come, is, is very much is something for us to be ashamed of, given the wealth that we have. So the question needs to be asked, is being resource rich a blessing or a curse for a country like Somal Islands? And I think it's important for us to ask that question because this is a country that economy is based basically on the, on, is driven by the exploitation of its natural resources. And in theory, after 40 years of exploitation of our resources, in theory, we should be very well off with all the minerals that have, the exploitation that have been taking place over the years, with all the, um, the logging that has taken place in the last 40 years, you and I should actually be, be, be well off because we come from resource owners. We come from communities that actually own these resources. Yet we find ourselves at the poor end of, of the deal. So something is not right at all. So one of the focus of this talk, of course, is to ask the question, when we talk about natural resource extraction and development, or the lack of development, the conventional view is that concerning the role of natural resources in economic development suggests that resource endowment is critical to economic development, especially in the early low income stages of development process. So when you look at the, the evolution of our development since independence, it has all been about the way in which we've been extracting and developing our resources. And then in theory, as we develop these resources, the proceeds that, the pop, that we, we get from these resources that goes through our, next slide, um, next slide, uh, yeah. That, that the population acquires more skills and those skills are deployed with increasing effectiveness to counter some of the resource deficiencies. So in other words, we are not just removing and extracting our resources, but at the same time, we're trying to put something back. But is that entirely true? I think we need to ask the question. What is the actual experience that we're showing here in Solomon Islands? And for the personal experience that many of us are going through, if indeed that we are truly benefiting from our natural resources, then we should actually have in this town, in this capital center of ours, we should actually see resource-rich communities who own buildings from Henderson Airport down to White River. We should actually see communities that own these logs and trees actually investing in real estate, not just here in Honiara, 
but also out in the provinces as well. But there's a growing body of evidence to suggest that favorable natural resource conditions does not necessarily yield the kind of economic returns that benefit the country. And I think Somal Islands, and to some extent, maybe to a larger extent, our Melanesian cousin to the west, Papua New Guinea, both suffer from the natural resource curse that in spite of all that mineral oil and gas and tuna and gold that we have, there's still a huge proportion of the population for whom services are not reaching, who are still struggling with schools that have no books, with libraries that have nothing in them, with clinics that have no... And yet, when you look at Melanesia, next slide. Melanesia and Somal Islands is we're the second largest country in the region in terms of, of our land mass. We, we also have a growing population um, just behind Fiji and also Papua New Guinea. And so in terms of land mass, in terms of um, the, the countries in the Pacific, Solomon Islands is actually one of the largest countries in the Pacific. And I've had the fortune, or maybe the misfortune, of being able to visit all the countries in the Pacific, except those that you can only go via boat, except for Wallace and Futuna. And one of the things that I've said and I've observed during my travels, and this is in my previous travels, and if I hope, I hope you don't mind, you know, Mr. Speaker and those of you who are in the public service, that this is a talk story. So um, there are things that I could probably say because I'm not a public servant that you, I know that you would want to say, but you are, because you're a public servant and therefore you're not able to, to say those things. But one of the things that I observed in my many travels across the Pacific was that I used to say that there were two countries in the Pacific that to me did not seem to make any progress. I went to Samoa in 1991 after Cyclone Val, and at the time you would actually see pigs running through the, 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 the capital town of, of Apia. And I also went to, I've been to Nukalofa and many of these other countries in, in the Pacific over the years, not just once, but several times. And I used to say to people that there are two countries that I've observed who don't seem to, instead of making progress, they seem to be regressing in, in the social and economic conditions. And one was Kiribati. For obvious reasons, Kiribati has very limited land area. And to be able to, to develop and expand, and build new roads and schools, they struggle. So they're really at the forefront of climate change impacts. But development is a huge challenge. But I'll tell you what, I've been back to Kiribati since then. It's a far cleaner place from than Honiara. They have a beautiful road from Bikini Bill to Basio. And it's, you can tell, and in actual fact, as a country, they're one of the richest countries in the Pacific because their reserve is almost worth a billion dollars. And so that's what they've actually used, funds that they've generated from the surplus that they got from the sale of fishing days to buy their new jets, their new airplanes. And so that just leaves me, leaves us here in Solomon Islands as the country in which just arriving in Honiara, arriving at the Henderson Airport, where you, you tend to find the, the you know, it just, it's not a good picture when our people come in. You see these betel nut stalls. And without disparaging, I always say that these men and women that you find out there, I actually admire them because that is an illustration of the entrepreneurial spirit that Solomon Islanders have. And given the opportunity, given the proper facilities, our people can actually engage in business as many of our men and women have been able to demonstrate along the, along the, the streets and, and of, of Honiara. In terms of resource endowment, 
we are embarrassingly rich with Papua New Guinea. So this just gives you an indication of what the resources in Papua New Guinea, I've used that as an illustration. But Solomon Islands, next slide. Um, Solomon Islands, ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, Solomon Islands is just as, uh, I'm sorry, these are not that clear, but Solomon Islands is going through the same kind of trajectory that, that Papua New Guinea is, has or is, being, is going through with the decline or the purported decline of logging. Mining is the next frontier for us. And so this is an old um, chart of where the tenements are, but mining tenements. So this is some, some years ago. But I know, and for those of you know, that from the new um, policy that has been adopted by the government, mining represents the new frontier for, for, for our economic development. And you just imagine that if we can't control and, and regulate and manage um, a, a renewable resource like our forestry sector, then imagine the difficulties that we will have controlling and trying to regulate the, the mining sector. And, I'm, and let alone, I don't want to even talk about the fact that the, the interests that we now have in the mining sector are those who are associated with the logging industry. So that's simply going to just exacerbate for me some of the resource struggles and problems and the governance issues that we have. Now, as I said to you, I've been around the Pacific and this just gives you an indication of some of the basic indicators. Um, and look at where we sit in terms of all the indicators in terms of our literacy, school enrollment, um, life expectancy. And I've drawn up a more recent uh, extraction from 2020 from the UNDP, which is probably in the next slide. Can you just draw that up? Which indicates some improvement in the life expectancy from, from a few years ago, from 60, around 64 to 73, um, the expected years of schooling. Um, and, but our HDI value for 2019, and this is something that is quite concerning, and that is that our H2I value for 2019 is 0.567, which puts our country, which puts Solomon Islands in the medium human development category, positioning it at 151 out of 189 countries and territories. And this is what we should be really feeling bad about, that we are ranked equal with the Syrian Arab Republic which is in a state of war. And so if all these indicators that we have is equal to a country that is at war and has, been, had, has civil strife, then something is wrong with the way in which decisions are being made. What's the next slide? Something is wrong. Something is definitely wrong. The way in which decisions are being made for a country that has enormous potential enormous agricultural potential because we have land for agricultural development, we have forestry, a natural forest and plantation forest, we have minerals, and we also have tuna fisheries. But to be ranked at the level that equates us with Syria is something that I wish we would be able to, you know, face up to and, and try and do something, because these indicators are for me the measurement of the progress that we have made in the last 40 years. And so, last week I mentioned that, I mentioned that we were um, taking water, drawing it from a well at Munda, but it was never like that. Those of you who probably grew up around independence will remember that many of our communities and villages actually had running water reaching to them. But over the last 40 years, many of these services and, and facilities have gone into decline and decay. And so here I was in my constituency, which by the way is probably the most developed in terms of the infrastructure of any constituency outside of Honiara because we have an international airport, 
We also have an international port. But we were drawing water from, we're still drawing water from the well. And in actual fact, I've made, the, I said, you know, I think when the Prime Minister went down for his celebration of the second appointed day in December last year, his entourage probably did not realize that many or much of the water that they were using in the motels were actually borehole water. But many of these facilities actually had pipe water reaching out to them in the past. So you tell me what's, what's happening in, in the country. So just coming up to, I'll go through this and then run through this very quickly. And I want to talk about a little bit about um, some of the problems that I think. But you see, we are very much dependent on logging. And I got an old, I got an old uh, slide. But this is the most recent slide that shows that logging is still, still primarily the predominant uh, resource that drives our economy. And so it's not something easy for us. It's probably easy for me to say and stand in front here and make these, these comments. But we're in the Ministry of Fisheries and looking to find funds to support the country and there's nothing else, all you can do is just simply drive down and put more pressure on the logging of our forest. Next slide, please. So with all the, for the last 40 years, with all the development that has taken place in terms of our timber, in terms of well, limited mining that's taking place, but then look at the mining that's taking place in, 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 in West Reynolds. Um, I suggested to the Prime Minister last year that they should, the government should actually help the people of West Reynolds buy out that mine so that if we create the now ruins of, the, of, of Somal Islands, they can let them, let them get their own wealth let them buy their own private jet and fly from Reynolds to Honiara. So what? They are enjoying the benefits of their resources. But they're not. We're all spectators <coughs> while the wealth is really tripling out into all these foreigners who are building fancy buildings and constructions. From Henderson, as soon as you get off the plane, from the domestic terminal down to White River. It's all being dominated. And others are taking over, while here we are, you and I, the resources owners, the people of this country, just being spectators. So why is it that in spite of the millions, millions, the millions that have been extracted over these years, we are still relatively struggling. We're struggling as a country. We're struggling to, to help ourselves and, and to provide the services that. So where has all that money gone to? Where's all the tuna fisheries, and especially the logging and mining and other, other mining have gone to? It should be so visible around what we see in Honiara. And what we see in Honiara is probably a lot of that money, but it's not in the hands of those who should actually be benefiting from their own resources. So something is probably not right. Next slide, please. Just to give us a bit of background on the forestry and way it, 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 just a bit of background to this. <coughs> it started in the 1920s. It was largely plantation forest. But in the 1980s to now, since it shifted to, 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 the, to customary land, most, most of the forest, most of the logging that takes place in the country is taking place on customary land. But I've, been, I've had my family land logged three or four times. And the uncles who signed these agreements, they still come around and ask for money to buy for their smoke. They have nothing to show. They've got no proper houses. Some of them have got no tanks. So something is, is definitely wrong in the way in which we are. The models that we're having or using is, is wrong because instead of empowering our people and making ourselves well off from our resources, we're actually depriving 
our own people and, and alienating them and disempowering them and actually making us even more impoverished. So you find communities where logging has taken place, that the quality of their lives have actually also gone down to some extent as well, because it's the quality of life is also related very much to the quality of the environment that you live in. But this is something that I'm so surprised and has not even changed. And that is the, <coughs> the standard logging agreements. And I was listening to a, a video recording or program that was done by um, is it Four Corners, I think, in, in, in 1996. And at, in 1996, they were still talking about 15% of the shares that would go to the landowners. 1996. This is 2021. And since then, the proportion of the value of a tree that the resource owner gets has not changed at all since 1996. That is almost shameful. And one of the things I always um, I, I try and compare is that fishing is is a hunting and gathering business. You don't actually own the fish until you go and catch it. But the tree on your customary land, you own the tree from the roots right to the top. And yet, we do not, the landowners or the people who own this tree only get 15% of the value of the tree. The license holder gets most of it, and then the government gets a bigger share of your tree. Now just imagine you in your house. You know, it's like, it's, it's like the tree is growing in your own house and someone comes into your own house and he takes that tree from your house. But you, the house owner, you're only going to get a small proportion of the value of the tree that's in your house. Now to me that is almost, and that has not changed at all. And the reason why you find a lot of families arguing over these logging operations is because they're only getting a small share of the pie. Now just imagine if they were getting a bigger share of the value of their trees. There would be a lot more money for them to be able to, to distribute and then minimize the social dislocations and disrup disruptions that arise out of people feeling aggrieved because they're not getting enough shares. Now, why has this not been changed over the years? Why has this not been changed? And I, 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 I believe that those who have refused to, 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 to get the changes in, in, in and improve this, uh, colluding and almost like it's a conspiracy, it's a criminal committing a com criminal offense against our own people because we are actually depriving the resource owners from getting a fair share of their own resources and so we're almost complicit so the story of the move on to the next one yeah the story of, of logging and mining in solomon islands is actually a very very sorry story there was an attempt made in 1979 i think it's still a very good model I don't know if it will work now, but there was a 1979 North New Georgia Timber Corporation Act. And that was an act that was modeled around the Fijian uh, Native Land Trust. And it was designed, it was established by parliament just after independence. They went to Fiji and designed this North New Georgia Timber Corporation Act in which the landowners in North New Georgia, and remember that at that time there was only very few operators, so it was designed to support Lever's operation and have a very, was a very good arrangement that actually worked for a while. There were five tribal groups that were all represented in the North New Georgia Timber Corporation. They were able to actually build up quite a bit of wealth, quite a bit of assets here in Honiara, also at Munda, and also in, in Giesel. But like so many of these things, this very good model actually fell, not because the, the legislation, the model was bad, but it fell because of poor governance within the directorship. And that's why it's important when we do these things that we actually get the right kind of people to provide 
the business advice. And so I don't think that we would probably get another probably model like the, the North New Georgia Timber Corporation. So basically forestry, it's a natural, it's a national resource. Um, some very poor stories and experiences with that. And I think when it comes to fisheries and tuna, it's a slightly different uh, story with tuna. And there's a reason for that, which I will go to um, when I go through how are we doing with our tuna fisheries. And you probably mentioned, you probably heard when, when um, Primo introduced me, the work that I did in the PNA office. And just to give you a, a, just an idea of where the value have gone to. I had, when I started off in, in Marshall Islands, um, it was never like this. It was a bit of a struggle, and it sounds like it's an easy, easy to, to go through. But if you look at the average price of the day when we started off, it was around 1,700. Now it's worth around 12,000 US dollars a day. Um, and so it's quite a significant uh, increase from 71 million in 2011 to around, it's not clear from there, but it's around 482 million last year. So it's sort of dipped, but it's gone between 70 to, to half a billion dollars in the space of about 10 years. Um, next slide. I think the other slides don't seem to be clear. <laughs> Sorry, I think we've lost some of the we probably lost some of the some of the other slides in this. We may have lost some of the the other figures uh, in the other slides, but yeah, essentially. Okay. Anyway, you may talk story. Uh -huh. then. Yeah. Never mind the slides. So the main. Let's look at what is the difference between um, these different sectors. From my experience, I think the key thing is, first of all, in ensuring, if you want to get the real benefits, first, first and foremost is the design of the instrument. The instrument is very important in how you and the model that you use. So the Vessel Day Scheme was an instrument that put the, transformed or changed the relationship between the fishing companies and the countries because that put the power in the hands of the, the, the countries themselves, whereas before, what was happening was that the fishing companies would, would come to individual countries and say to them that this is how much we're going to pay to come and fish, and you did not have any choice. So the instrument that we helped to design and put together changed that relationship, and instead of us taking what they said they would pay, we created a market. So we actually changed the fishing opportunity and we created a market. And that market then led to them to then compete amongst themselves, to then buy for the, pay for the fishing opportunity. And we also at the same time created a bit of what's known as scarcity, so limits. When you apply limits, what actually happens is that the value goes up. And so that's basically what, what we did. But I think more importantly is that the governance arrangement for with respect to the management of a regional resource differs. In that we're fortunate in that we also have regional organizations like the Foreign Fisheries Agency, the PNA Office, the, the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, providing additional layers of governance to oversee and insulate from all those political pressures that you would normally find in a national situation. And so from that, without that additional layer of governance, I think we would also probably face the same kind of pressures that we face in the, in the other natural resource sectors that we find is not actually um, we're not actually getting some of the benefits from them. One of the, one of the, um, there might be some, you know, I, I, I see 
some opportunities going, going forward for Solomon Islands in trying to address this. Um, part of the problem that we have also, of course, is because of the huge pressure that we have to develop from our resources, then corruption and political corrosion in systems have permeated and come into the management of resources. So we know what that all leads to. And so with, with respect, I know for a fact that the logging industry, for example, is very influential. And that's when I talk about some of the, when we, I talk about those who are involved in, in making these decisions are not just those who are elected in parliament. Very often we, we complain and we say that it's our politicians who should be making these decisions, but remember that there are very powerful forces outside of politics who have a, such a huge influence in the way in which decisions are being made. And there are also very strong relationships that you find between key individuals, key Solomon landers, key in individuals who hold key positions in government, who are actually in business with some of these logging companies or individuals who are associated with the logging companies. And therefore, you find that in that kind of environment, it is not possible. It is absolutely it's not possible to fix the problem because the incentive for those who are there to fix the problem does not exist because you're going to be cutting off. Once you fix the problem and fix the governance problem, then you weaken and undermine the power and control that certain individuals have. And I often say to, I often say, and this is, I'm glad that, you know, you young people are here, that this country of ours, we are, it's not actually controlled and influenced by Solomon Island. It's a very powerful outside individuals who are working very, very hard in this country who are actually undermining and influencing many of the decisions that, that are being made because they're very cozy relationships that exist that support not just the political establishment, but they also support some very key individuals in government. And you tend to also find that this cozy relationship, that, and that's what I talk about, the undermining of the system. If you observe very closely, you will find that there are certain Solomon Islanders who are associated with the political establishment who are unelected, who are then, you find them in all the key state-owned, well, not all, but in most of the key state-owned enterprises. And so I'm not really surprised also that you have maybe some foreigners behind some of our political parties who are shaping and colluding and so and I'm glad Jane you here as the representative from the uh, electoral office but I remember when the the cross border vote cross border voting was was um, the amendment was introduced and people were so happy because they said I can now go and vote in my own island and I can vote but we forgot that there is a if you really look at it very carefully. There is, a, there is an altruistic motivation behind that because it's all designed to ensure that those who are already in power entrench the power that they have because it allows cross-border voting simply allows you to, you know your core number of voters and I can bring in X number of orders from Malaita or from somewhere else and we'll, we'll boost up my numbers. That's what it's designed to do. It's not designed to, to allow you to, to vote um, and go and vote and flex. We should be voting where you actually reside. So if I was working in Temotu, I should be voting in, voting in Temotu. Whoever wins there is my representative. When I come to Honiara, the representative from Honiara should be my representative of parliament. That's the way it should work. But remember, remember, that in the grand scheme of things, that there are all these, often all these underlying hidden forces that's working to collude and influencing this, this uh, influencing decisions. And there's a rat just went past. <laughs> so some of the decisions they're making are like rats, you know? It's just like rats because they are not 
they're making decisions in the best interest of, 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 of the people. Now, you will also find, and I say so once again with a, with a certain uh, great sense of respect, that the institutionalizing, the institutionalization of, and the way in which the government, and the government institutions now work is you, you find that there are also certain very influential, non-elected, non-public sent, but they're politically appointed individuals who are inside the prime minister's office, who are also, who also, you must remember that they too have such a huge influence and in, in, in the way in which these decisions are being made. Now, with China here, they are the ones who are also going out to meet with some of these Chinese investors. I remember getting an email when I was still with the PNA office, an email from one of the political advisors in the Prime Minister's office, boasting to us, and apparently he sent that same email to all the ministers in the PNA, boasting to us about a cannery that they are going to be building at Tatamba in Isabel. And you know, this is the kind of undermining where you already have the public service, you've already got your technical people in the public service. And I, Minister and I, we were workmates in, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In, in, and his, Mr. Speaker, yeah, <laughs> sorry, the Speaker and I were actually workmates in, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. At the time when, and I say so with great respect, uh, Andrew, um, permanent secretaries was a, was a public service, was a career. It was merit-based. And so you became a permanent secretary because you literally worked your way through the system. And it was free of all the political inf interference and influence that you now have. I remember very well the time when the 1989 public service bill was, was put through by Solomon Mamaloni. It was designed to achieve one thing in particular. I think there was a sense of frustration. They felt that maybe the public servants, PACs were becoming very powerful. And therefore, they felt that if we have our own people as permanent secretaries, they would push some of these issues and, and, and um, push some of these reforms quicker. The problem that you now have is that our permanent secretaries have become scared of their ministers. And so you know that I've had private discussions with quite a number of them. So you know that what the ministers want is, wants to do it may not be the right thing to do. But because your, your, your appointment is subject to the vagaries of the minister, that you're scared to then talk out. And all these things, all these, you know, confluence of um, actually influence the quality of the decisions that are being made in the government. It influences the quality of governance that we have. And that is why you find that we have such poor returns from our resources. And that is why you find that we're still lagging so much behind. There's no secret about the development of this country. Good governance, respect for the law, political stability, having a merit-based system. People get appointed to jobs because they are the best who are available, who can do the job and make sure that this country moves forward. Those are some of the very simple solutions, but it's easier said than done. And this is why I'm so happy that we are here in this forum talking to you as young people because this is your country. It's your future that is at stake. It is your jobs. It is your children who are being affected. And those of us who have had the opportunity to set in place, we will probably be remembered for not doing the right thing. And we don't want your, the quality of your life, the quality of your children, and your children and children after them to get worse. So the onus is on you young people. If you, if you show no interest in ensuring that your future is better, and I feel very sorry for this country. 
I've never seen, let me just address, if, let me address you young, young people. Now. I have not seen a group of students from USP or from CNU organizing a, a march or a demonstration or a public rally to talk out against something that you feel is going to affect your future. I was a student at Papua New Guinea. And I tell you what, in Papua New Guinea when I was a student there, any little thing that people felt or came out on SIBC, they came out on, on the radio that they felt was affecting, going to affect their future, they would have a public forum and they would organize public marches down to the office of the Prime Minister, to the Parliament House, and they engaged because they were concerned about the quality of their future. They were concerned about the decisions that they were going to make. So the future really is, lies in your hands. Same energy that you put into moving, using your mobile, you've got the tools that you have now to mobilize your, the energy that you have. We did not have the tools that we had in those days. So the, to me the solution lies because it's almost going to be impossible, I think, to get these reforms through the legislation that we have because of the cozy relationship that exists between you know, individuals, outside forces. But it really rests with those of you who are in this room and outside. I will finish off by saying there was a module that I was teaching at the School of Fisheries on governance. It was on governance, but I said to them, well, there's two things for me that would, you will see as a result of governance. Governance of natural resources aims to achieve two things. One is it aims to achieve sustainability, good management of the resource. And if we manage it properly, the second objective of good governance is going to be achieved, and that is you will get the economic outcomes. So let's ask the question, we can ask the question when we look at ourselves that the economic outcomes for me actually demonstrates that resource owning groups should actually own quite a bit of real estate in this country. They should actually be owning a number of businesses, whether it's here in Honiara or in the, in the islands. That to me would really demonstrate that the economic outcomes from good governance is actually working. But on both fronts, it's very clear that there's nothing, there's very little evidence to show because when you get off the plane at Henderson, all the way out to White River, there's very, very few. We could probably count with maybe both hands, Kwaimani Building, um, who else is there? Who, who own NPF, who own some of these real estates. And when that is done, then our future is actually quite bleak. But our future is hopeful and optimistic because of people like you in this room. And so I'd like to encourage you all to take an interest in these issues. I'd like to encourage you all to form your debating societies, form your environment societies, and, and be able to the Speaker of Parliament would be really happy to see the public gallery filled with USP and CNU students, even shouting to the members of Parliament to take action. So on that, note, on that basis, I, I thank you very much for, for listening. I apologize, it's probably a bit dis disjointed in terms of uh, uh, the presentation, but um, I hope that um, you will go away feeling angry but also inspired to, to question and do something. Thank you very much. And I shall um, I give uh, this time to the audience to ask questions. And this is also extended to those uh, joining us online. Uh, if you have any questions or comments for Dr. P. Uh, Dr. Mikaram, one question about interest where you tell him today. Introduction, blow, 
layo pina you raising from a 16 million uh, project to a 460 million project U us within just four years what now secret play you and miss have teach him students and then um, encourage him about that too yeah the solomon islanders can country blame me himself a make a quick shift from status blame me as a least developed country to at least developing just as other Pacific Island countries. Because you may have rate you may lower just like the atoll countries where you may get them lower Pacific. I have no more questions from you. Uh, thanks, Director, for, for, that, uh, for that question. Me always, as a small beginning, this but you blow me that time is small, so me fellas have to go salem cut cut for school fee. At a time where we follow home, him no any market and it was a shameful thing. But from that I always wanted to I always wanted to do well. And for me it's it's there were a number of us, there's, there's a number of things that actually worked for us. There was a good, there was a group of us who came together at the same time. Group of officials and group of ministers. We were lucky that we all came together at the very same time with all that same desire. All we wanted was to do well. And for me personally, because I come from Munda and from my own personal experience, with the hardship that I had, I knew what, that I said, well, me like I'm looking, people blame me the Pacific Islands, who must benefit from resources blowout. And even when I was Tamil Law FFA, time we start off as director law FFA, deputy director, I wrote a two page of all the staff. And I set out that this is the vision that we want. But one thing you must never forget, at that time we used to have a lot of women who walk on their backs with firewood on their, on their backs. I always told the staff, the expatriates and the locals, never forget that what we're trying to do is to give them a better livelihood. And so we were lucky that we all came together with that, with that vision. And with that vision, we set off. It wasn't easy. There were differences. There were disagreements. There were you know, accusations. And not everyone wanted to come on board. Um, PNG and Kiripa threatened to leave. But some of us had the the, the big vision in mind. It was very clear that in, 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 in the process of designing and inst developing these institutions, you're not going to make everyone happy. It's impossible to make everyone happy. But you can design instruments where you can all agree to work together. And I used to say, the best agreement is one where we all come and disagree, but walk away happy. Because you're willing to to then make your compromise. So we kept passing that same message. And it wasn't until they saw the increase in revenue that they gave 150%. And that's where you saw, like from 1912, we started in 2012, when the revenue started to increase, that's when they realized that yes, we were really onto something. But you can do the same thing with logging here. To me, logging is not, it's not, uh, it's not rocket science. It's probably even easier uh, to address in the sense that it's there. At least tuna, it moves. It's an international migratory resource. Fishing vessels are from different companies and all that, and all, so and so forth. So it's, it's much harder to manage your tuna resource. But you can manage. And so one of the, one of the things that we, we can do in, in Solomon Islands is um, well, first of all, the political economy of logging, as, as I explained, is not, is not easy. There are very powerful forces that are working. But if you can bring those under control, under control or actually remove those forces, and so you, 
I'll make a confession here at this point. We had a conversation at Langalanga in March with the Premier of Malaita Province. We were there for a day with the PS of Forestry and Environment. And it was my, I suggested to the Premier, I said, look, why doesn't Malaita take the lead by announcing that you, will, you won't have any foreign involvement. Foreign is involved in your logging industry in Malaita from 1st January 2022 to give you space. And then you know, you've got your Windrock, you've got these other opportunities to then set in place a new model that involves resource owners themselves. But we, we mustn't leave them floating because the last thing you want to do is do away with the current model but then don't have anything in place to support our, our local people. So that's what um, well, Malaita has taken on that as a policy. Um, whether it's going to be done is, but if they can do it, then they will probably be able to set, set an example to the rest of the other provinces. And don't forget, as young people are here, technology can also play an important role in improving systems for governance, um, whether it's in the public service, but also in the logging industry and in the mining industry, there's real scope for the government or whoever to build a forestry information management system where you can barcode or you should be able to barcode every single tree that is actually logged and you can trace that from where it's logged to the market, international market. Developing a digital traceability for our logging industry. So that gives you better monitoring. So I, I, I did not actually mention that there are ways in which you can actually, and things that you can do to improve, improve management. Thank you. Uh, I think there is a question online. Um, from... Uh, Dr. Tashishest Tara. Uh, Dr. T, can you talk about China and natural resource development in Solomon Islands? That's the question. Yeah. Talk about China and natural resource development in Solomon Islands. Yeah. I, I forgot to mention also that you know, China is a key player in terms of our natural resource development. We are, early this year, I think we were the largest exporter of tropical hardwood to China. And also, a, you know, a few years ago, we were the sixth largest in the world. But in terms of our export of, of logs to China, we are a, a major trading partner uh, with China. And so, in, the key concern I, one of the concerns I have is that I think with the role that, um, the, the dominance that, but let's not forget that as a, as a society, also community, I think as a country, we're very, very much integrated also with, with China. But the way in which the Chinese deal, they don't come in in small, in, a, in very small scale. And I think to that extent, we have to be a bit mindful, be careful, because one thing is we don't also have a lot of experience in dealing with Chinese companies. And the way in which China operates in terms of natural resources is they, they deal through their state-owned enterprises. And it's, they are the ones who would come down, meet with the ministers, meet with politicians, meet with people in the Prime Minister's office. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, there is an office in the Prime Minister's, there is a unit in the Prime Minister's office. Um, there's an association there, but there are, and there's a unit in there that's actually helping to, to you know, promote business and trade with, with China. I, I, I find that it's, it's, it's a bit of a worry for the, to the extent that we don't actually have that experience in dealing with you know, large, <coughs> Um, state-owned enterprises from China. They actually have a lot of um, force as well. But 
that does not mean to say that we cannot engage with them in terms of our natural resources. I think the experience in many other countries is a, it's not a very happy one, but there are things that we can do. And one of the things I did say, I went and met the Prime Minister in May last year, and with Jimmy Rogers and I said, this relationship with China is, you can, we can actually uh, control and manage it. And we manage it by ensuring that if, if there are investments from China, we ensure that at least 80 to 90 percent of the workforce is absorbed locally. That 80 to 90 percent of the, um, you know, the hardware and all the other materials are also actually in, in sourced locally so that we improve and help our domestic economy. But, you know, the Chinese, they normally based on turnkey operations. But in terms of natural resources, I think we only have to look at you know, some of the other countries to be slightly careful. And my main worry is not so much China, but I'm more worried about ourselves here out in Solomon Islands. I think we don't have the wherewithal, we don't have the experience, and we don't have the, the, the governance structure. We don't have, and we're very, um, what's the word, susceptible susceptible and uh, naive in many ways. It doesn't really take much to get favors from, from someone. And they will, the way the Chinese, they do, it's they, part of their culture, they will come to you and they will give you some money, which is easy to then undermine the systems that we have. So I'm really not so much concerned about China as I am concerned about our inability to be able to even manage what we have now. We can't even handle what we have now. Just imagine if we are going to have to deal with a, with a greater monster than uh, the, the smaller ones that we are struggling to deal with, who are taking over <laughs> Honiara. Um, and they're so visible. They're doing a great job. They're providing jobs and all that. But well, increasingly, I mean, you and I are just walking, you know, we feel like you're in a different, or oh, it's going to get worse, actually. And I'll tell you what, once these borders open, there will be a huge influx of Chinese coming in here. And they are not going to worry. I mean, they're going to go out into the provinces, because all they'll see is this beautiful agricultural land, and they'll put enormous pressure on communities, on different island groups. There will be pressure that they will put. So just wait for COVID-19 to finish, then the borders to open and you will, we will see. It will be actually worse than, if you think it's bad now, just wait until COVID ends. It will be worse. And that's my worry because I think we haven't handled it uh, properly. But it's good for tourism. I mean, there'll be dollars and investments and coming in. But it shouldn't come at a cost. Huh? The cost is that if we, are, if we are able to get involved in businesses and all that, it would, it would be great. But um, we, we're, not, we're not doing it even now. So. I hope that answers your question, Ra. Thank you. We have another question um, from Elis Hofa Bula Ol, Dr. T, do you think there are some lessons that could be learned from Vanuatu in terms of consultation processes which help guide the national policy? Thank, thanks, Elise, for your question. I, I, just to answer your question, I, I'll just respond by referring to a conversation I had with, with Mark Ramston, Elise, uh, a few years ago. He was a former New Zealand High Commissioner here to Solomon Islands, and, but he was in Vanuatu as the, I think, their first secretary or someone, but he was working in the High Commission in Vanuatu. And one of the things he said to me, Elise, was the difference between Vanuatu and Solomon's is that in Vanuatu, the public servants and the people still have no tolerance for corruption. Whereas in Solomon Islands, it's almost susceptible from top to bottom. That's the huge difference. And I think what has happened over the years, Elise, I mean, there's clearly there are lessons to be learned 
And one of the things that Vanuatu has managed to maintain is the chiefly system. The chiefly system in Vanuatu is a very, the chief is a very respectable word. Whereas here in Solomon Islands, it's almost an insulting word to many of us because one of the reasons why um, chiefs are no longer respected is because many of them are also involved in the logging industry and they, they are known as, uh, known as um, you know, LOs and you find LOs, our LOs, our chiefs, they tend to come up and they're in motels, they go in taxis and they're not distributing the funds community funds from logging and as a result of that the respect that people have for chiefs is no longer there because they don't guide and, and rule properly and I think also our, we've lost the opportunity that in Vanuatu respect for the chief is part of your DNA you grow up with it you hear if there's any dispute we'll go to the chief the first place they will go to is to try and resolve their problems by consulting the chief and then they go to the police whereas we still have that and I think in some places we want to try and rebuild that respect again but you know, many of the young people have not grown up with that kind of system so it's going to take time at least unfortunately I feel really sad and something that you feel proud of in Vanuatu because they've been able to maintain and also in some of the other countries um, in the region where they've been able to maintain their chiefly system, which has actually helped a lot uh, in, in governance. Whereas that's probably part of the problem that we, we face in Solomon. So maybe the traditional governance bill is going to, to address it. I have my doubts because these are things that you grow up with. They, they things that, they're generational things. Values that you have are generational values. And if we don't have those values, we've lost those values in a, over a generation. It's not going to be easy to, to fix them. So I'm actually looking at the next generation to fix these problems because generally speaking, communities and countries and societies don't allow things to disintegrate. There's going to be a point in time when people will say, enough is enough. We need to take back this country of ours. We need to take control over it. We need to get rid of all these corrupt practices and have a, 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 you know, a law-abiding um, as most people are, but because they're suffering from the malfeasances of one or two people, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. T, and uh, uh, thank you for the audience, uh, you all, everyone, uh, all the students. Uh, perhaps uh, let me at the outset uh, uh, clarify where I'm coming from. <coughs> I'm here not as a speaker of uh, national parliament. I'm here as an uh, indivi individual. I'm here also as someone who believes in, uh, in academia and uh, information, free information uh, sharing. And so the presentation by uh, Dr. Transform uh, this uh, afternoon is uh, part of the ongoing process. And I'd like to thank uh, Calvin this is, in fact, my, my second uh, uh, session to attend. I unfortunately missed the, the second one, but this is the third, so I am quite... Make number what? No, this one, yeah. Anyway, I was sure that this is uh, the third one, and therefore <clears throat> I only missed one. Now we'll continue to, to attend, but I'm here not as a, as a Speaker of Parliament. But again, from the experience that uh, Transform has uh, conveyed and shared with you, students, uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, we were brought up in the public service in the 80s and 90s, and I could well recall all the instances and the situations that uh, Transform uh, related to, particularly in 1989, when the public service uh, became, as it were, uh, unfortunately politicized, uh, beginning with the Public Service Act. Public service has always been up to 1989, uh, prior to independence, uh, as uh, contained and enshrined in the Constitution. Um, it's, it's politically neutral. Uh, governments come and go. Uh, the public service remains. The public service is the permanent government. Um, unfortunately, that, unfortunately, that seems now to be not the case, that it is also tagging along uh, with, the, with, the, with the political uh, 
um, institutions, particularly uh, with the uh, political governments. That, that's really the rather unfortunate situation. Therefore, there is no check and balance. It become, has become weak, in my opinion, uh, from the experience I, I've come through. Um, free term member of parliament, um, a former permanent secretary, um, not in foreign affairs. I was schooled in foreign affairs, uh, ended up by virtue of that particular amendment uh, as permanent secretary on, on three-year contract in the Ministry of Provincial Government. And that's why I saw all this that is related, I saw it from the standpoint when I was permanent secretary from the, permanent, uh, from the Provincial Government with that experience in external and the actual experience internally and then went on to the floor and parliament, become a lawmaker. One thing I can say is this, that um, <clears throat> no individual can change the equation and the problems that we are set to. It has to be, it's a collective uh, 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 body that has to do it. So you have to you know in terms of policy, yeah, you change him, it has to be a, 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 a by body, not by individuals. So although the, the, the maxim says that you, 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 you harvest what you sow, and that is through the elections, not necessarily because until and such time as we have a body that can dictate, determine, and guide the policies, then of course a change will come. And it hinges on the vote that you ca cast. Okay. That, that's where the, the difference is. And that's where the weakness from, from the standpoint previously and now where I am, I think this is where the, the weakness lies. In the understanding on the role of the legislature, on the role of members of parliament. If you have it wrong, you're going to get what the outcome is not going to be what you want. So that's where it is. Um, I'm also the chair of the Electoral Commission, um, which you know, determines uh, uh, currently at least, uh, but some of the issues that were raised today, for example, yeah, um, the 2018 Electoral uh, Act amendment will we'll see this, uh, this course border voting a bit more difficult because the two elections are now going to be cast at the same date, the provincial and national election. And you have to qualify to be voting on the ward and the, the constituency. You can't say, oh, me by ward, law constituency, but province, I won't. You can't. Okay. The choice is no longer there. So you have to vote two ballot papers on the election day come the next general elections. You'll be voting for the provincial government and you'll be voting for the city council, you'll be voting for the national elections. So that, the electoral commission is tightening up. In fact, because of the shortest, shortness of the timing in the 2018 amendment of the electoral act, did not allow the electoral commission to uh, fully um, execute the provisions of the electoral act in 2019 elections. So now the commission is not preparing for that. But I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because in hindsight, this is where the problem lies. Because, you know, what we went through, um, of course, uh, transfer will explain resource curse. This is resource curse. And examples of resource curse where, where dependence on the natural resources has shown, and I think the, the data that was shown today has resulted in the, the countries that are so dependent on resource or resources are performing very, very badly in terms of economic growth, economic development. And Solomon Island is a good example of a country that is cursed because of its abundant resources, yeah. notwithstanding the fact that all efforts, and we become victims, second biggest country in terms of population in the region. Where do we stand against the backdrop, against those smaller countries? They are outperforming us. The population growth rate, of course, also has an impact. I'm just making those general comments uh, which uh, uh, I thought I, I need to make from the standpoint uh, where I'm coming from, the experience uh, uh, in the past, and also to share. For all this, I do not one moment dispute the presentation by, by, by Transform. Um, I fully concur and uh, do accept the fact I'm standing here as an individual Solomon Islander, who's concerned about the trend of uh, uh, movement of where the country is, is going. And I've, I've seen that coming through the last 40 years in the service of the public service. I think this is where I can vouch. And I'd like to thank you all. 
please do continue to attend these sessions that are organized by the uh, university center. It's, it's so critical. Academia, uh, no, there's, there's nothing correct in anything that anyone says. Okay. I, I, I'm not preaching here for the gospel no more. Um, but for the moment, yeah, uh, please do appreciate. Uh, thank you, Transform and the uh, uh, organizers of these talks. I will continue to support uh, whatever uh, events you want to uh, 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 mount on behalf of the students. Um, Jane, are you still here? Okay. Um, Jane is the CEO of the Electoral Commission. Me ready for come down and say, I'm, I'm hurry, I'm hurrying, I'm going to the, this, this meeting. What is it, Miss Hongo? Okay, I'll come along. So that's why she's here. So, because I know she's here because we told her in five random next elections. We did not, we told me one, we told her no run for random last elections. But we are gearing up uh, by virtue of our appointments uh, for the next uh, general election. But let me emphasize again, the future is in your hands in the next generation, in the existing generation. For the future, the future of this country be belongs to you okay, and your children. Um, whenever you exercise him, uh, this is not politics, your vote. Your vote counts. Okay. Unfortunately, I have to say it. If I have to repeat it, this is where the change will come. No anywhere else. Yeah. Only the vote will, will change it. Thank you.